In advance of our first live event happening on February 11th, 2023, the Residence 11 Desire Summit on Sex and Relationships, which will be held in Los Angeles and live streamed worldwide, we're speaking with one of our speakers from the summit, Nana Darkoa Sachiyama. Nana is a feminist activist, writer, and blogger. She's the co-founder of Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women, an award-winning blog that focuses on African women, sex, and sexualities. And she writes frequently for The Guardian, Open Democracy, and elsewhere. She works with the Association for Women's Rights and Development as Director of Communications and Tactics and lives in Accra, Ghana. And you can find out more about her at darkoatherwriter.com. Nana is going to be a speaker at the Residence 11 Desire Summit talking on the topic of why we all need to talk about sex. Make sure you hit subscribe wherever you're watching this so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming interviews. And now let's jump right in. Welcome, Nana. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Rachel. It's great to be here. How are you doing? I'm good. So sex is a, oh, a big part of your career, and we're going to talk about that. But first, I want to talk about what did you learn about sex? when you were growing up? Well, I think the problem is I feel like I learned very little about sex. Nobody really said anything to me about sex growing up. I went to a very strict Catholic boarding school, an all girls school where we still had nuns as teachers. You know, um, they weren't our only teachers, but they were our religious studies teachers. They were super influential. There was no conversation about sex. I don't even remember being told like the basic biological stuff. I mean, I'm in my mid 40s, so this was um, being in school in like the 90s, right? So I didn't know how much things have changed from what I hear, not very much. I feel like my sex education was more or less, there used to be this really popular show on, on TV in Ghana, which is where I grew up. And there was this protagonist, a pastor, right? And in the show, what would invariably happen as a young teenage girl would get pregnant, she would get thrown out of school and, you know, her life would be miserable. And at that point in time, my mom would always turn and point to the TV and say, see, this is what happens when you mess with boys. So I was really fearful of messing with boys, even though I had no idea what messing with boys really, truly meant. What about your friends? Um, did you, did people talk about it? Like, where did you learn about it then if it wasn't from school or at home? Well, the thing is, you know, there was this, like, at the same time, there were all of these rumors, right? And a lot of gossiping about the girls who were rumored to have had sex, right? And in a sense, you would just kind of look at them from the side and think, oh my God, she's a terrible girl. So it wasn't like an honest conversation, an open conversation. I really didn't start, I think I was also maybe a very late bloomer. I really didn't start having conversation with my friends about sex openly until I was about 19 years old. I had left Ghana. I was now studying in the UK. And yes, that's when I started to have, I wouldn't really call them meaningful conversations with my friends, but I was being teased because at that time I was technically the only virgin, you know, amongst my friend group. So I didn't feel like that was line and rise that was then starting to feel a little bit ashamed of being a virgin at the time. So this, I, I don't know exactly when you started your blog, but I'm curious, how did you get into blogging about sex and why was that something that was important to you? So the inspiration from the blog came from a beach holiday I took with friends and it was like December, 2008. So a really long time ago now. And we had gone to this beautiful beachside town. Um, and the town is called Aksem for anybody who wants to visit Ghana at some point in time. It's in the Western region of Ghana, close to the border with Ivory Coast. Just so, so beautiful. And I was with a group of about five other women from different parts of the African continent. And the conversation would turn to the topic of sex time and time again. But I felt to me that this time, the type of conversation we were having was very different from what I used to have or not even have as a teenager, right? It felt very open-minded. I felt like I could really share my desires, my experiences, my fantasies, that other women were doing the same. And 
I was just like, wow, why has it taken me so long to be able to openly have a conversation with other women about sex? And that trip was also to celebrate my 30th birthday. So that goes to show, right? And I came back to the capital Accra where I lived at the time, just feeling so energized. I was like, I really want to create a space where women are able to speak to one another about sex, where we're able to learn from one another without a feeling of shame or without feeling any sort of, you know, guilt. And, you know, I came back, I called my friend Malaika. She was the one friend I could always talk to about sex. And I said to her, I know what I want to do. I want to start a blog about sex. Coincidentally, she was, she had been interviewing her grandmother about her experiences of sex. So she also told me how she'd been thinking of writing a book about sex. And I said, you know what, let's do the blog together and later on we can turn it into a book. And that's really how my work around sex, sexualities and pleasure began. Wow. So what, what was it like when you started it and what kinds of reactions did you get and stories did, did you get from other women and what are the biggest things you, you've learned about sex and women's sex lives from working on the blog and, and later your book, The Sex Lives of African Women? I mean, when I started blogging about sex, I, it was almost like <laughs> I had finally found a space where I could pour out all my thoughts and my questions. You know, I remember in the very early days, I would like blog every night. And I started very much from the self, right? It was me sharing my own personal stories sexual experiences I'd had, intimacies I'd shared. And then what was really surprising, and I hadn't really thought about that, was the reaction. Lots of people were commenting. Lots of people started to message me, ask me questions. Other people started to share their stories with me. And then it dawned on me that what I needed to do was also to encourage other women to share their stories. So somebody would usually sort of, you know, reach out to me and say, hey, I had this experience too. And then I would say, how about you write about it for the blog? And usually the reaction would be, well, I've never written anything before. And then I'll say, go on, just like try it. And if it works, we can publish it. And invariably, like most of the people who sent me stories, these stories were incredible. They were so interesting. There were different types of stories, right? Stories of experiences people had had, stories of sometimes really traumatic experiences people had had. People also had to write fiction, right? I think people found the very freeing to explore their desires by writing fiction. I was getting overwhelmed with the number of submissions I was receiving that I gave so many people, <laughs> well, not so many, a certain number of people. At some point in time, we had like five or six people who were contributing so regularly that I gave them their own username and password to the blog so they could upload their stories directly. And for the most part, these were women I had never met. Um, and so, yeah, it was just really inspiring. It quickly became a collective space where you had women from different parts of the continent and the global diaspora sharing their stories around sex and sexuality. I probably should have asked this earlier, but why did you decide to focus only on women? Why was that important to you? And did you do you also have readers who are men and did men react as well? Yeah, it's funny because every time we've looked at our analytics and looked at who our audience are, 42% of our readers are men. <laughs> and, you know, the first time I saw that statistic, I was, I have to confess, a bit dismayed because, you know, I write with women in mind. At the same time, it also makes sense that men find this content useful, right? Because I think we don't always have the opportunity to learn from one another. We don't always have safer spaces where we can access, you know, sort of comprehensive information around sex and sexuality. But I was writing for women because I knew what my experiences as a woman had been, right? I knew that, in a sense, boys were all, always allowed to sow their wild oats, whereas women could not do that, or if they did, they were slut-shamed, right? And so I felt like I wanted to unlearn some of the really harmful things about sexuality I had been taught growing up. Um, and I felt like other women would probably benefit from unlearning as well. And I wanted us to do that in community. You know, um, I didn't feel men would have the particular set of challenges that women had around sex and sexualities. I do think men obviously have their own set of challenges. Um, but as a feminist, I chose to focus on 
you know, the experiences of women and yeah, working with other women to just create more space for these type of conversations. Sadly, I think the slut shaming is pretty universal around the world. I mean, I'm sure it takes different forms in different places, but I think a lot of women can relate to that. So you touched on this, but I, I want to ask, you're a feminist and you just mentioned feminism. How would you say feminism plays a role in the work you do around sexuality and in making this space for women to talk about sex and just have better sex lives? If I wasn't a feminist, I definitely would not do the work that I do around sex and sexuality. You know, I think one of the oldest feminist mantras is the personal is political. I think there's nothing more personal than your body, right? There's nothing more political than taking ownership over your body, taking ownership over pleasure. If I, you know, was not a feminist, I wouldn't feel it was also politically important for women to access pleasure, for us to advance sexual rights for sexual minorities. My work is absolutely because of my politics as a feminist. Um, I know your interviewees range from their 30s to their 70s. And I'm curious, what did you, as someone who's in your mid 40s, which I also am, what, what did you learn from the older women that you interviewed about sex that you think would be especially useful to people of all ages? Yes, yeah, so for my book, I actually interviewed women who were as young as 21. And like you mentioned, the oldest person I interviewed was 71. I personally found my conversations with the older woman the most energizing, the most inspiring, right? Because I think especially in popular media, somehow elderly women are desexualized and we're made to somehow feel like once you hit a certain age, you know, sexuality takes a back seat. Now it's time to get out the knitting needles and look after your grandchildren. And I'm sure knitting is fine. I'm sure having grandchildren is great, but you can probably do all of that and have an active sex life. And actually the older woman I spoke to, you know, I felt we really live in their best sex lives. They were very confident in their bodies. They had had years of practice, like everything else, sex takes practice to get better. You know, um, they were comfortable in the kind of relationships they had chosen. I found them super super inspiring and i feel like there was so much i learned from them from you know thinking of pleasure in every aspect of your life to thinking of food as pleasure to continuing to experiment you know no matter what age you are to taking things at your pace and only doing what your body feels able to do you know so I remember one woman I interviewed, Alexa said, it's not about the quantity of the leaven, it's about the quality of the leaven. And that really resonates with me. And I think it's relevant for women of all ages and people of all ages, really. That makes sense to me too. Um, what do you wish more people, and especially women, knew about sex? I think I wish more people knew that sex gets better as you grow older. You know, and it gets better because you have a lot more practice than you did when you started out. Um, I feel like also your desire grows. You grow more confident in yourself. You grow more confident in who you are. And yes, we don't need to buy into the stereotype that somehow as you get older, you wither and, you know, fall off the tree somehow. I think you can be hot at any age. You're going to be speaking virtually at our summit on February 11th on why we all need to talk about sex. So I wanted to see if you could share a little bit more about what you're going to say and what, why, why do we all need to talk about sex? And especially for people who, like, I've been writing about sex for over 20 years, and I feel like some people, I mean, they want to overshare the minute I say that, but then other people... They, I think that a little part of them want to talk about it, but there's so much cultural baggage around that's private. You shouldn't discuss that, or you'd be revealing secrets that you shouldn't talk about. And, and I think it's a hurdle for people, even if they do want to do it, but something's pulling them back. So maybe if you have some advice for people about how to talk about sex, whether that's with their friends or partners or doctors or anyone. Hmm, I really love that question. 
And I think how to talk about sex it really depends on who you are as an individual. I think in everything you do, you need to be true to yourself. You might want to start by talking to yourself about sex, by journaling about your own sexual experiences, reflecting on some of those experiences. You might want to find a trusted friend or two or a couple to have conversations about with sex. You might want to read a really great book, hint, hint, <laughs> I'm the author of The Sex Lives of African Women and hear what other women have said about sex and use that to spark conversation with your partner or partners. I think you have to find what's comfortable for you. And I think it starts really from the self, from examining your own you know, sexual experiences. And if you choose to do so, you know, you may start conversations with a wider group of people. I think the most powerful work as it was done in community is always done with other people. And it's super important to talk about sex because if we can't talk about our bodies as a source of pleasure, how can we talk about anything else? That makes sense. And speaking of talking, I know you've also organized the Adventures Live Festival for African women around sexuality. Can you tell us more about what happens at the festival and how African women can get involved for the next one? Yes, absolutely. We've been running a one, well, we started off as a one day festival, then we expanded it to two days and we may expand it even longer. So we've been running a live festival about sex, sexualities and pleasure. We've held three editions in Accra, Ghana. This year we held an edition in Nairobi, Kenya. Next year, we're actually thinking of going to the Caribbean and we're planning to advertise our events even earlier so people can you know, travel for the festival. But it's really a space where we can have conversations face to face about sex, where we can hear from, you know, leading sex educators, from people I regard as semi experts, from rope masters, from wellness and healing practitioners, you know, from people who've been writing and thinking about sex and really just have a space to be in community with like minded individuals who are looking to both live their best sex lives, but advance sexual rights for people all around the world, especially the most marginalized people, you know, including queer people, including trans people, including sex workers. And where can people find out more about the festival? They can check out adventuresfrom.com. The full name of the blog is Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. Okay, and wrapping up, what are you working on next? I have started the work for my next book. And actually, that's also what inspired this um, the topic for my for my talk. It's actually going to be titled We Need to Talk About Sex. So that's what I'm working on next. And for that book, I'm really interested in exploring the idea of sexual freedom as well as you know reclaiming traditional African practices around sex and sexuality. That's great. Thank you so much. Everyone check out Nana's book, The Sex Lives of African Women, and her website, darkoatherwriter.com, and tune in February 11th. You can watch live stream um, anywhere around the world, and you can find out more at summit.residence11.com. Thank you.